how are you doing okay yeah are you fine um, so how, how's, how's the situation at home with you <coughs> uh, in israel yeah well uh, i i think it's much better than europe yeah uh, but we are under a curfew yeah so now it's a uh, holidays it's the passover the easter so basically the curfew is complete you cannot leave the towns or you you're basically you're not supposed to go further than 100 meters from your home okay wow and 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 people so otherwise they're they're being patrols there are police on the streets uh, uh yeah. military whatever so okay so that's much heavier basically than here in the netherlands in amsterdam where where I live, because we just about an hour ago we had a new press conference of our prime minister saying that basically he was sort of proud of the Dutch that they sort of yeah, they kept their distance and they they try to stay at home as much as possible, but we don't have patrols or or, or police in the streets saying you're not allowed to go there and there. Um, so basically, people are still sort of free to walk around, but in a restricted way. So it's quite it's quite heavy still in Israel, but the 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 the, the curve is flattened as they. Safe. Yeah, uh, completely, completely. Okay. Uh, I think they want to be extra safe, but uh, okay. And they uh, compared to other countries, you know, we had the uh, uh, 60, 60 dead people. Oh, okay. Which is like you know, we, it's sad, but it's uh, compared to other ca uh, countries, you know, the numbers are very low. Very low, very low. Well, that's very good. And so personally for you, as a, as a writer, is, is, is a time of crisis like this, um, uh, is, it, is, it, is it a good thing for you? Is that, is that a situation that's created outside, just outside of your home, a very strange, unique sort of situation? Is that a good way for you to work in? Or, or is it some, are you busy, occupied with so many other things uh, except for writing? I mean... Um, well, well, I wouldn't say it's good, you know, because it doesn't feel good, but it is interesting, you know, it kind of gets you curious and the, and the thinking and inspired. I, I've written, I think, like, at least three fiction stories, you know, during this time that, that deal with this vibe, you know, and about a couple of nonfiction pieces. Uh, because I think that, you know, that, that when you write, you... What you, I try to do when I write is basically to break the force of inertia that we have in life. Yeah. Because most of the time in life, we're kind of passive, you know. We go to work or we go to school, you know. We pick the, our children from the kindergarten, you know. We go and visit our parents on a weekend, you know. It's like everything is on a routine. Yeah. And the, I think that art uh, has the power of kind of breaking this force of inertia and kind of touching something that is genuine. And I, I feel that there is something with the corona virus that it stops the force of inertia in life. And I think that it makes people ask themselves questions they wouldn't have asked otherwise, you know. I mean, this is... What kind of question do you ask yourself, Edgar, for instance, uh, since the virus broke out? Well, you know, it, 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 the, the, uh, because of this uh, coronavirus thing, I had the four four trips cancelled. Holland was one of them, yeah. but I was also supposed to go to Turkey, and to Germany, and to France. And the and basically, instead of having a month in which I would fly from one country to another, I have a month where I stay put. You know, mostly in, in my room or my balcony. You know, I talk a lot to to my son, to my wife. You know, and the. And the vibe is totally different. And like looking at it, it's not good or bad, you know, because I like traveling and I like public events and, mm -hmm. and I, you know, I like interacting with people. But now I'm doing something different, you know, and, and it's not necessarily worse, you know. So, so this idea is that suddenly there's something that changes your course, course of life, you know. It's a, I think it's a, it's a, it, it's my mind opening. I mean, you know, I think for, majority of people right now, you know, they're dealing with a, with a difficult illness or with a terrible economical situation or, or with the fact that they have to stay in quarantine in a very small space with big family, you know. So, so in that sense, you know, I, I think the virus actually uh, 
it puts into extreme the economical differences in our world, you know. Yeah. But, uh, but having said that, you know, apart from all this pain and anxiety, there is some kind of an authentic uh, existential, existentialist aspect, you know. My uh, son, uh, uh, in these four weeks, he started drawing, you know, and began running around our house, you know. So he's like... Uh, 14 years old, he never wanted to draw, he never wanted to run, but suddenly he's doing both, you know? So, yeah, he discovered this yeah. about himself, yeah. Yeah, so, so, I, so I think that, you know, I think that, uh, that, that this vibe of kind of uh, confusion, you know, it's like, I often say, uh, see life as some kind of an obsessive compulsive behavior, you know? And sometimes when you're obsessive compulsively doing stuff, if somebody gives you a slap or shouts at you, you have to, it's not pleasant. No. But it makes you kind of look around you and yeah. instead of going through motion, the motions. Yeah. Is it also true, Edgar, that a lot of people say about your work, also your about your latest stories, when I read the reviews, this is, by the way, this is the book, people. Mein Konijn van Vaderskant in Dutch. And in English, it's, it's Fly Already. They keep saying that your universe is absurd. You read it about certain authors, you read it about painters, they, they created this absurd universe in which they work. But isn't that, to me, it seems that basically to you, this is not an absurd universe, this is, this is just your universe, you know? So it's, so, no. No, no, it's, I, I'm saying it's not your, it's not my universe, it's, the, it's basically some take on trying to show the reader how I perceive life. Yeah, you know, this is how it feels like to be me. So, and when c can you remember? Not not when you started writing, when you wrote your first stories, but can you remember when you started looking at life like this? Can you remember a certain point as a child, or maybe a little bit older, a situation that you then you that, that you looked at life, and then you 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 thought, well, maybe I can I can perceive it a different way. I can do things with what I see, with what I perceive. I can take directions. I can take turns because. That is what you're exactly what you're doing in each and every story. You you start at a just a given point, and you take directions, and sometimes it seems in every which way you like. Can you remember the first time that you experienced that? Well, I think I think you know I'm child of Holocaust survivors. Yeah, and my parents, my both dead, but my parents suffered a lot during the war. My mother had lost both her parents. Her mother was killed in front of her eyes. Her brother was killed yeah. in front of her eyes as a child. And it's something that I knew from a very young age. And I think that there is this kind of phenomenon among uh, second generation children that they, they feel a lot of compassion towards their parents. And so they don't want their parents to feel bad. Mm -hmm. so, so basically there is something in the dialogue that they have with their parents. It's almost kind of like a sales agent recommending life, you know? Yeah. Saying, you know, it's really, it's not that dangerous. You know, or wow, look, this is really nice. And basically, you know, my parents never needed it because they were much more optimistic and positive than I am. But still, it's something that you know I always, I've always felt. And my mother, she had a fabric store yeah. where, where basically mostly elderly ladies or I don't know women, women of all ages, I guess, would come and buy fabric to make dresses. You know. Mm -hmm. And the, when, when and it was in the basement, there was no windows. And my mother, many times she didn't ha have anybody to leave me with, so she would take me to the store. And the, and she would put me on the table. And you know, I think I wasn't maybe I was three years old, you know, maybe not even that. And I would sit there, and the, basically when the clients would come, I would speak to them. They were mo mostly women. And and they had all kinds of dynamics, like they would come with their husband or with a sister or with somebody. Usually they wouldn't because we we were a little bit far from the center, so they were always drove there. So they, they would always come in pairs or groups. And with me, I think I had this kind of urge. I, I kind of I whenever somebody came, I would see their weakness, like their fear or you know or their uncertainty and i would make an effort to kind of i don't know see them or be compassionate to them or help them and the, my mother 
this is, is my experience, but my mother remembers it, how I was this kind of wunderkind that yeah. I was so little, but I was this attraction because I would say, oh, you know, Mrs. Cohen, this brings out the green of your eyes, <laughs> or, you know, or, you, or, you know, uh, oh, you sure you're 68? I was sure that you're 35, ha, ah, ho, ho. And, you know, and I would, and all my attempts were very, very pathetic but, and over the top. But I was this kind of little talking monkey that women would, <laughs> other women would come to see because I was really cute, you know. And my mother said that when I started going to childcare, the, the sales dropped. Like, less <laughs> women would come because they would come to see this little kid who speaks like a polite, you know, gentleman, old gentleman. And with me, like, nobody asked me to do it. But this, I, this kind of a feeling that you see people's pain, you know, or you see your own pain in people. You look at them and say, oh, oh, oh I know how it feels, you know. And you want to say to them, it's going to be better, really, really. I know it, it looks really crap now, but it's going to be better, you know. And, you know, it was this dynamics that say, I remember that there was this... Uh, a woman coming with her sister and the sister was very beautiful and the woman wasn't beautiful. No, not so much. <laughs> and I would always say, make this effort, you know, to say something about how nicely she dressed or something, you know. And it was this, this kind of a encumbering feeling. But I think that when I started the, when I think that when I started the uh, writing, it kind of, it took this kind of, maybe, a hysterical place of meeting reality and say, oh, you know, and kind of being relaxed about it and just kind of going there and and looking at those kind of uh, painful places or weak places and trying to find some comfort or some way out. So, you, so, so to make a story out of a situation like that or to, or to feel out someone's pain or maybe even your own pain is making you able to control it or something like that, to just make it into a, a short story and then, then it's dealt with. Is that, is that correct? Is that what you did from yeah, a child it, and you're still doing today or? Yeah, I'm, spoiler alert, I'm gonna ruin the sixth sense to people who didn't see it. But I, I feel a little bit that, that writing is a little bit like the, the child in the sixth sense that you know, yeah. that, basically, that basically in the movie, yeah. he sees dead people. And it's very, very scary. And in the end, he discovers that those dead people, they, they, they're no danger for him. They're just lonely and, and they want to communicate with him and they want his help, you know? And I think that for me, there was something that, they, that writing made me stop being scared of my feelings and my emotions. So what, because, what, what, because why, it, sorry. What, why, why, what are you scared you? about your feelings and your emotions? Is it, what, what, why, what? what could harm you so what 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 held you back well i think I, I think there was something first of all overwhelming about them you know yeah. this ability as i remember as a child i don't know a, a a crying with no control you know from things that other children around you didn't understand you know why are you crying because you saw a dead bird or a little thing but, but also this kind of feeling that there is something overwhelming about life, that it's too much. And the idea is that when you write it, yeah. when you say, you know, it's not too much, it's just a lot. You know, it's not too much. It's when, 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 you know, when the water is in the swimming pool and not in your lungs, yeah. then suddenly it's okay, you know, it's okay to have a lot of it, you know, because it's not kind of overwhelming you. So and is it is it so most of the times it's an emotion uh, that that starts off the story or a small scene maybe on the street or something you see outside, but sometimes I have the feeling, but maybe I'm totally incorrect, that it just starts with a sentence in your head. Sometimes the first sentence of one of your stories, I can imagine that a sentence would pop up in your head and then it, that is just the starting point and it will take you somewhere or is it always an emotion or something a scene you see on the streets or could it also be just the first sentence and then see where it takes me well it could be the first sentence if if the first sentence has something that is unresolved for me you know yeah. if there is something about it that kind of I find exciting, but I cannot commu communicate what's exciting about it. It's like, for me, it's like this, uh, the story is this kind of very, very slippery, 
hairy creature who runs around yeah. your, my study. Yeah. And basically you have to catch it by, by the tail, you know, and the tail could be really a situation. It could be a sentence or something. Yeah. And then it will drag you somewhere. And if you hold on to it, then you discover what's it all about, you know. But I can tell you, for example, in the latest story I wrote, uh, I wrote a story uh, about in Israel, we have this curfew for a long time. Yeah. And there is something kind of uh, strange that because of these curfews that they uh, get going out becomes this kind of big deal. Yeah. Like, you know, you say, you know what, I'm not going to go out, you know? Yeah. And there is, I don't know, and like a tiny interaction, I don't know, a guy coughing on the other side of the street or I don't know, a, a, a car going and spraying water on you, you know, all those kind of things that you say, you know what? Maybe tomorrow I stay on, you know, this kind of thing. Yeah. So I wrote a story about the, about how the curfew ends. And when it ends, you know, the government waits for a few days, but nobody go, goes out. Everybody stays in their apartment, you know, a little bit like, like uh, those Japanese in the jungle after the war is over. Yeah. And basically, and basically they, they send out the army to knock on door and say to people, go out, go out now, you know, to pull the people out. And it's a story about this woman that is forced to leave her apartment and what she feels going back to the street, you know? Yeah. She doesn't remember anymore where, where she used to work or what exactly was she doing, you know? <clears throat> and, the, and this idea is that, that the story begins from this sensation of, of myself that I say, you know, I could get used to it, you know? I could like, I actually, I don't, I never need to leave home. I can no. order takeaway, you know? So, so, so where is it taking me, you know? And, and most of all, what is scaring me? So what makes it so difficult for me to go out now? What is it? And basically, you know, I had to write a story to figure out what this thing was, you know, yeah. the last sentence, the story kind of solves the reader. And it's amazing because, yeah. because when you write it, you, you know, you, you, don't, you don't know what you're writing. I, I always say to my students that uh, by definition, a good story should be smarter than the per person who had written it. Yeah. You know, because if you write what you know, then it's like assembling an Ikea furniture. You know, exactly. it's not, a, there's no art in it. The art is when there is something that you almost know, you know, that you, you fix it, you know, you can hustle your way through it. And then by mistake, you say that thing that, that is, the truth, you know, that yeah. you were able to avoid for so long. But in the process, Edgar, sometimes when you when you allow yourself to just uh, wander off, basically, and explore the boundaries of the imagination or, or in ways of telling a story, um, does it happen to you that it gets too far sometimes? That it just that it just sort of overflows uh, the boundaries of the story you want to tell, and with that basically the emotion you want to grasp does it escape you then sometimes what do you do then well you know i think most of the time when i write i fail you know yeah. it's really it's like a, it's kind of i don't know it's kind of like those people who who's, who say to you hey look at me juggle you know and all the apples fall on the floor so i'm saying even those guys sometimes they're able to do it a few times kind of before before it crashes and and for me, this is the default. Like when I come to write, I say, okay, I'm going to fail now, but you know, it's going to be fun. You know, I'm going to play with words. It's okay. And once in a few times, you know, or like once out of every six, eight, ten times, then you do it and say, hey, well, you know, there's something in it, you know, and the, and the, and what is and when that? it happens, when, when, when do you, how do you know, or ju you just know? Well, with me, I think, you know, writing a story, like many times you begin writing and, it doesn't come to anything, you know, the story doesn't have a direction or it stops in the middle. But I think for me, uh, knowing that you got the story is knowing that you got the tone, how it yeah. sounds like, what is the rhythmus, what kind of sentences you have. It's much more important than the plot or yeah. the character because, because it's a little bit like when you write very short stories, it's a little bit like surfing, you know? Yeah. It's kind of, it's like a surfer is not like a, when you ride a bicycle and you have to cycle. A surfer, what you have to do is keep your balance. Yeah. And basically this, the tone is what basically kind of keep, keep this balance, you know? 
And it's like, you know, another story I wrote right in this period, I think the first sentence is, uh, 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 the world is about to end and I'm eating olives. Yeah. You know, so, well, you know, and then it becomes a story about how did, did how did this guy buy the olives? Yeah. The way, like, if, it, if the world would be about to end and you go to a supermarket to buy olives, like, what would it be like? You know, and, and the story takes you somewhere. Is it also the reason, Edgar, that, that, you, you, that you fail or that you allow yourself to fail so many times that it took almost, I think, six years before your new edition volume of, of, of short stories came out? Or is that... It, it's even it. more, I think. Like, yeah. well, if I take the gaps in Israel, I usually publish a book like every seven years, sometimes eight years. Yeah. But I do other things too. Okay. Yeah, you write graphic novels, you do films, you do at, 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 uh, you perform so many times and you have to travel uh, uh, a lot. Um, yeah, I'm saying writing-wise, like I, I also, I like, I write, work sometimes on screenplays, on plays, I direct, I, I, I write children books, you know, I, I, but I think that there is something about writing that it's always, what, what's helpful for me is this idea is that there is a zero stress about it. Like, yeah. you know, it's the good thing, you know, if you write no, best-selling novel, it's another thing. But if you write short stories, you know, your publisher will never nag you, you know, say, hey, you know, it's been <laughs> six years, book? give me a book. They won't mind. They say, oh, Edgar isn't calling, you know. Have you ever and tried they, it, writing, writing a novel, Edgar? It's always been short stories, right? I mean, this is your forte. This is your thing. Never, not a novel, right? Yes, it's funny because, again, you know, it all starts from the place of writing short stories in my life. Yeah. That it's a place of a... Uh, total freedom, total irresponsibility, you know, I don't have a writing routine, or I just write when I feel like it. Uh, you know, sometimes I write stories and, and you know, and because I'm so kind of, I lose the stories, I save them, I don't remember what the file's name, I put it somewhere, you know, it's like, sometimes when, when I'm asked by them from a magazine for a story, I start looking, like I write B A and look for what on the screen. Oh, maybe this. Ah, yeah, you know, it's a, it's really, it's like a total mess. And and the idea is that that it's this kind of a obscure hobby of mine. Yeah. Well, I'm a professor in the university and I give lectures and, and this. So so in this place of freedom, if I start writing a novel, I, I take responsibility. Yeah. So I rather if I have to take this responsibility, I rather write a screenplay or a play which is all about collaboration and dealing with the constraints of, you know, production budget and stuff. So this is real life. So if I want to do something big, I do it in real life. But yeah. here I just come to play around and feel free. You just mentioned that you, you, you teach, you teach creative writing as well, uh, a few places in the world actually. What is it that students want most of you, Edgar, of your writing? What do they want to learn from you? So not necessarily what you want to learn them, but what do they ask you specifically about your stories? What do, what do, do they want to grasp from you that they can apply to their own work maybe? Well, to be honest, I, I don't know. And I think, you know, we never open enough to talk about it, but, oh. but I can tell you that what, what I try to kind of give them, because I really, I don't, believes that you can teach writing. You know, I always yeah. say the So basically the world is divided and people say you can teach writing and you can't, but so, and you, you clearly, you, you say, no, it's not. No, no. no. I always say to them, you know, that in the workshop, I say to them, look, this is a little bit like an AA meeting, yeah. you know? It's basically, you know, we each gonna stand up and say, my name is Edgar and I write strange shit that never really happened. No. And you say, we love you, Edgar. It's okay, we do this too, you know? You're a good guy. And, and I think that what happened in, in a good workshop is that basically the, the, the students and the, and the instructor, they create some kind of an acoustics that help the, the student hear himself and, or herself and know what he or she wants to do. Yeah, okay. you know, it, it's, basically, it's basically not saying you do this, but because, because I often, you know, my metaphor for those workshops is a little bit like as if an alien, you know, you would learn, uh, would uh, land with his flying saucer in Amsterdam yeah. and hold his sign and say, I give a, I give a tours to Amsterdam. And he would take you say, and this is Anna Frank's house. And as you see here, and you say, man, you're, 
it's just got here, you know? Yeah. And that's what I feel that when I work with my students, you know, I cannot teach them about their hometown, no. but I can teach them to, to look at, the, at those places they tend to miss, you know? Or to say, you know, whenever you pass this street, I don't know, you put your hoodies on. Why? Why do you do that, you know? So, so it's more about kind of a, assisting, you know, yeah. or being like this kind of a Jiminy Cricket, you know, yeah. that, that helps people kind of find what they're actually looking for because it's, it's very difficult, at least for me, to find what I'm actually looking for. Yeah. So what, what writers, what authors told you? you? You spoke about voice is maybe the most important things about your story. Um, what authors you, you looked up? Uh, you looked at looking for a voice, trying to discover your own voice, or you maybe even reading now during the crisis at home. Well, for me, like the, the most uh, important factor in that sense that through his writing, I I I, I realized that maybe I could write was Kafka. Okay. Be because you know I, I come from Israel, and our tradition of writing, maybe it has to do with the tradition of a young country, is that that our writers, they, are, they had something very constructive about them. They were very competent, you know, they were like mentors or teachers, uh, people who, who can call everybody to the town square and tell them something. It could be ethical, you know, or moral or emotional, but, but they're basically like, you know, those the super powered guys, you know, the late Amos Oz, David Grossman, you know, they are those kind of figures. And for me, reading Kafka, that you know that you the first thing you will feel from Kafka is his anxiety and, and his incompetence. You know, yeah. it's a it's a guy who wouldn't let babysit my my son five minutes. No. You know, no. No. and, okay. and I'm saying so it kind of open up a a different relationship between a, a reader and a writer. I realize that you know that a writer doesn't have to be authoritative and most certain and know some answers that his readers don't have. Maybe it's enough that you be uh, honest and uh, perceptive and will be able uh, to raise questions that he doesn't have any answers for. <clears throat> and this I, I, I've learned through Kafka. Yeah, okay. And so uh, right now you, you're working on several uh, new stories uh, which has to do with, with, the, with the crisis, with Corona. Um, would you see yourself maybe even making a volume full of short stories, mainly from this period? Or is th will this period just be another part of your ongoing, fantastic, wondrous sort of life? Or what do you think? Well, well you know, I think that, uh, that, let's say, I think that, that every period in my life is different, so I, I feel I write differently. But I think that this collection that just came out, Yeah. It's very much uh, in the coronavirus vibe, even yeah. though it was written before the coronavirus, because it's a lot about uh, solitude and isolation. Yeah, very much. And so. the word that keep changing around you and you don't understand really what are the new rules. You know, it's about people who, who you, are used to be passive and then suddenly find themselves in a situation where they're obliged to be active and it kind of teaches them something about themselves. So. So I think that, you know, that when I wrote this book, it's not that I knew that the virus is going to come, but, but what I did know is that I was in, when I wrote it, I was in my late 40s, in a word that kind of kept changing and stopped making sense in many ways, you know, yeah. as a parent, many times I know you teach your child something. So I, w I when, when a, a President a Trump said, that, you know, he grabs them by the pussy, yeah. And my son at the time listened to it. He said to me, what, what's going on? Why do they keep showing it on TV? And I said, oh, you know, this guy, he wanted to be the president of the U.S., but they just released it's something very offensive that he said to half of the population of this earth. So now he's not going to be a president, you know? <laughs> and, you know, a couple of months later, my son said, you know, you know that the guy said that he's not going to be president. He's actually the president. And this is kind of feelings that, you know, you say, well, I don't know. I remember that when politicians say something really offensive, you know, yeah. about all the women in the world. I I used to, I remember vaguely that they have to pay for that, right? You know, yeah. but, 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 so it doesn't matter if it's political or technolo technological that I'm very bad with each and every app. And, 
And also I see my son, the way that he uses those apps is that, you know, with me, like when I learn something, it's for life, you know? Yeah. It's basically, you know, how to drive a car, you know, how to work the ATM, you know, I've learned it 30 years ago and I still do it. But with my son, he learns it kind of knowing that in 10 months or one year, he's not going to use it anymore. No. You know, his interaction with it is basically, he has no attachment to those apps. He really no. doesn't care, you know. No. They keep calling me from the cell company that I have a very old phone. <laughs> and they keep I urging know, me. I know, I know. They keep urging me to change it. I say, no, 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 but when I speak, they hear me on the other side. It actually works, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I understand. Um, um, Edgar, it's time maybe we, we should go to a few questions I have here. And, and I'm supposed to read them, I think. So I'm, I'm quite curious. Um, Can you do voices? Like, you oh, know, you wanted voice. me to do voices. Well, what kind of voice would you like? Would you like? No, no, just for the question. Some things oh, that would be appropriate. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> you know, a guy with with a beard and a pipe. You okay. know. Well, the first one, Edgar, a beard and a pipe. Could you explain, Edgar, the relation between the email at the end of the title story and the story itself? And it's ask Peter van Scherpenberg. Uh, I. Well, yeah. Well, it, it, it would be a little bit of a spoiler, but I try to be kind of vague. But but I th I think that the that the story, the email story, is basically a story about a about a guy who emails an escape room. I, do you have escape rooms now? You have this definitely. Yeah. So he wants to he wa he has a, an elderly crippled mo mother that he wants to bring to the escape room at a date, and the the. The guy from the escape room ex explains to him that it's the Holocaust Memorial Day, so so they're going to close the escape room. Yeah. And this guy starts arguing with him because he says, you know, my mother, she's a Holocaust survivor. And then Holocaust Memorial Day, it's the toughest day for her because she has to remember all the trauma. So I thought I'd take her to an escape room, but because you respect the Holocaust so much, you're going to make my, wife, my mother's life miserable. And this starts to become this kind of an exchange. And for me, the exchange has to do something that I, with something that I see a lot in Israel. And this kind of idea, this uh, feeling of righteousness coming from a feeling of victimhood. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it's like, you know, if we, we go through history, I think that it's a good argument to say that Jews are maybe one of the biggest victims of modern time, you know. Or even if you go back, you know, I don't know, from French Inquisition, you know, French, Sp Spanish Inquisition, you know, and even Jesus, you know, he was a Jew and they crucified him, you know, and they, and then you go, I don't know, to the, to the pogroms in uh, Eastern Europe, and then you go to the Holocaust, you know, we have a track record of yeah. you know, people doing bad stuff to us, Definitely. and the idea is that, that in Israel, the it's almost, it feels sometimes the region is doing this kind of Eurovision of victimhood, you yeah. know? You have you have the uh, European Jews carrying the burden of the Holocaust, and you have the, the Jews coming from Arab countries, yeah. carrying the humiliation of coming, you know, to this state and being uh, looked yeah. down at by the European Jews. And you have the Palestinians in the region that have the trauma of having everything taken from them, from them. And this kind of idea of a dialogue of basically people disregarding other people's suffering and trying to promote their own suffering, you know, to win this Eurovision or Mondial of, of a victimhood is something that I, I feel a lot in the Israeli society. And, they, and I feel that sometimes it blocks empathy because you're so immersed with your own pain and suffering that you really don't have the any any spur emotion for other people's for other people yeah exactly and it's yeah. and it's a very good uh, um, uh, example actually of how you avoid writing about Israel and the situation in Israel all the difficulties all the tension in a very direct way it's all always this is actually one of the most direct ways of your writing about that situation so most of the times if if it's in a story it's sort of in the background somewhere, or it's in, 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 in a paragraph only, or it's in just an, ex, uh, an exclamation of someone. It's never, it's never the theme, I, th I think, in, in, in your story. It's, it's, it's always there, but it's never about it. Is that, is that, is that, yeah? yeah I, I, agree with you. I agree with you because stories for me never come from themes, you know? No. 
like if I have an idea, I do a sticker and put it on a car, you know. If yeah. I have a sentence, something to share. But but I but for me, even the story, like you know, in hindsight, I can say that uh, this kind of victimhood competition is a driving force in it. But when I wrote it, I did I wrote it really from this genuine place that, you know, my mother was a Holocaust survivor and my father yeah. was a Holocaust survivor. And in Israel, in a Holocaust Memorial Day, you can see in TV, in all the channels, in all the radio, they talk 24-7 about the Holocaust. Yeah. And, you know, and you can't go out to a restaurant and you can't go to the theater. And for me, I would see my parents dreading this day and I would see them suffering during this day. Yeah. And as a child, I thought the Holocaust Memorial Day was kind of some kind of way of, I don't know, torturing Holocaust survivors mm. for, I don't know, for surviving, you know, yeah. it's a way of getting even with them. And I kind of kept this distorted thought that, w- that w- was so strong in me as a child that I started writing from this kind of childlike perspective, a place that is very kind of a afraid and closed, you know, and the story came out of it, but it's not that I wanted to write a story about that. No, 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 and it's never, it's just like what we talked about earlier, that you you don't start from a certain idea or a theme, no, you start from a scene or an emotion or sometimes only even a sentence, which, okay, yes. not different, not a question, Edgar. Um, yeah. uh, uh, okay, Eva, is asking you, uh, Edgar, Laszlo Grasna Horkai recently said in a public interview in The Hague, every new book I write is proof of my failure. I am to write a book which says it all and I never succeed. So I have to write another one, try again. Do you recognize this feeling? Well, actually you do because we, we sort of discussed this, the, 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 the failure, right? About, about all the yeah, time. Well, you know, I, I, for me, life is the failure. A writing is a miracle, you know, the, the miracle is that out of this failure, you know, something of substance can come up. You know, I yeah. think that it's funny. It, it, it's, you, you know, we talked in the beginning about, you said, this is a, ver- it, this is a terrible period, but maybe it's good for writing. Yeah. So, so I think the first, the first uh, work of art that I was attracted to during this, this time, this coronavirus uh, time was, I went and looked for a Raymond Carver poem and this poem is about this guy, is it, uh, it, it, it's about Raymond Carver. And Raymond Carver uh, say, uh, writes a poem about how his daughter's dog got run down by a car and died. Mm. And how he buried that dog. Yeah. And how he wrote a, a poem about burying that dog. And how the poem was so good that he thought that it was almost worth it that the dog died. Yeah. Because he got such a beautiful poem out of it. And, and, you know, and, and I think that this is taking it from the negative side, but from yeah. the positive side, you could say, how does something that is about pain, about weakness, about failure, can become something like something that is comforting, yeah. something that is uplifting, you know, that life is just kind of shirts and trousers with a lot of stains and, yeah. and places that you forgot to shave. And, you know, it's, like you know, in a good good case scenario, you get to work on time and fuck up. In a worst case scenario, you'll be late to work and fuck up. You know, it's not gonna work, and you're gonna die in the end. But if you if you're able to connect with it in such a way that is devoid of this kind of force of inertia or competitive spirit or capitalist spirit, and just kind of say, wow, like you know, the the entities that created such a thing, there's something so complex and beautiful in it. It's like watching a sunset or a gazer or, wow, like that's something. Then, then for me, there is something about writing that is a, that it's the opposite of failure. It's, it's, kind of, it's kind of like, you know, it's as if like, a, you know, it's, it's like in the US they have this show, like a, a, a best uh, home videos or something yeah, like, yeah. you know, where, where people barbecue and then the kid is set on fire and they yeah. run to the swimming pool. So I think that writing is a little bit like this, you know, it's <laughs> like I'm saying, home videos, yeah. no, be, because, because funniest home video, because I think, you know, that if your son shirt gets burned and, and your 
wife says, you stupid fuck, why, what are you doing? And then you roll him in the sand and he's crying, you know? It's a terrible experience, but, yeah. but if he's on fire and you throw him in the swimming pool and it's on the world's funniest home videos and you know, and your aunt, you know, in Cincinnati sees it. And not only that, like all those people who had a bad day, they see your kid catch fire and they laugh, you know? And they laugh because it's this Kentucky, it's this huge catharsis because it's not their son. Yeah. And also he fell into the swimming pool, so he's safe. So who? Oh, Life is a mess, but yeah. we were able to escape it this time. So, so I think that writing is a little bit like that. Okay, excellent. The marriage funny some videos in writing. Thank you. Uh, you uh, talking about dogs, there's a question about animals in your story. Ah, hi, Edgar. There are quite a lot of animals appearing in your stories. What kind of role do they play in your stories and your life? Best wishes. Well, I, first of all, I love animals, you know, yeah. uh, and the... Uh, our family, we have a rabbit in our in our home, and and the idea of having a rabbit, by the way, came from a visit that I had to Amsterdam, uh, where I met a, a Rodger Lamb, who's one of the filmmakers who had made the documentary Edgar Kerr based on yeah, the yeah, yeah. story. Really nice documentary. And 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 he had a rabbit, and the three of us kind of saw that rabbit, and then when we had an opportunity to get one, we had one. But they, but in general, I think I uh, I, I like animals. Uh, first of all, because I think the difference between animals and human beings helps me understand more w what it means to be a human being. You know, it's like. Okay. Uh, but but also I think that you know this kind of idea is that the, this thing that is very exposed in animals and uh, not and uh, honest, you know, earnest. So what do animals teach you? To be earnest or to be honest? So there's no, there's no oh, they, they mockery teach me first or... Of, they teach me to, first of all, to be in the moment in one sense, yeah. you know, uh, not to, like, not to, uh, not to, to be enslaved by this kind of ongoing anxiety that always pushes you, you know, to, to kind of change reality around you, you know, but, but maybe more to accept it, you know? And there is, you know, I like the warmth, you know, and the, the uh, something that is a, that is a, I, I don't know if simple is the right word, but you know, but kind of a, works the way it should, because I think that, you know, that the, we, we, not we, you're okay, but I tend to overthink, <laughs> and you know, and, <laughs> and, 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 and I think that, you know, that the, because animals don't overthink, they all already give me something to learn from them. Yes, but Edgar, to, to, on the other side, to be honest, um, if if you would have, you wouldn't have that complex mind, that mind which which searches for alleyways and open doors and new windows, even if those windows, doors, and alleyways are not there. That is your mind. Then you you couldn't write. I mean, if you would be, you have the mindset of a dog or of an animal, just being in the moment all the time. All these wonderful escape routes you have made for yourself, they wouldn't turn into all these stories we are reading and and, and you're giving us. So that's that's sort of a, that's not fair to us. No, but 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 you know, but basically, what you you, you use the word escape, you know, yeah. and I think that I think that you said you say to me, if you were an animal you wouldn't ha make this fascinating and beautiful and intelligent escape mm -hmm. because there would be no prison, you know? Okay. So, so, so the idea is, I think that literature or art is a solution to something that, you know, I don't think that <clears throat> animals are incapable of art. It's like, you know, those three dogs look at each other and they say, how come no dog ever painted, you know, a Mona Lisa, you know, they don't give a shit. They don't need <laughs> it, you know? And, and, and so, so I think it's kind of, it's amazing because the ability of us to compensate for something that, that, that is a problem, it's basically by overthinking, we're able to do something with our overthinking and turn yeah. this energy to something that is not destructive. Well, I think it's impressive, you know, yeah. it's like, I, I, I like it and I'm happy to be part of it. But I'm saying, I don't think that, you know, not having the problem to begin, begin with. I think maybe it, it's less beautiful. If, if I would be a creator, I would want to create 
creatures like me, you know, I think, exactly. you know, you know, I think it would be like kind of fun watching them, you know, kind of roll around the carpet and doing silly yeah. things. But uh, but uh, but I just want to say that I don't feel superior to animals. I no, just no. feel different. Okay, I understand. So we have maybe time for one last question, and and but it's a really important question, um, and being put by your publisher in the Netherlands, Joost. Um, mm. He he would very much like to know. It's a very good question. Did you ever? laugh out loud really really loud or cried out loud over something you wrote yourself one of your stories did it make you weep or cry or like like for in in the story told you know that the guy is saying you wrote all these stories about people made, that made people cry made people laugh but now i want you to write me a story to get girls into my bed so but did you ever one of your stories or made you cry cry well, or well, laugh out loud? you know it's really embarrassing because when i write a uh, stories <clears throat> I I laugh a lot and I cry a lot and I'm kind of I think that you know that there are those moments. It's not even the egomaniac moments because I don't think about my ego. I mm -hmm. just kind of feel as if like I enter this space, I discover this kind of thing. I I feel that the universe become wider, you know, in a very very kind of a embarrassing way because it's not that. Con connected to the quality of the content. It's just yeah. this kind of feeling that I have, you know? Yeah. And the, and the, uh, I, this is one of the reasons that I, I need to be alone when I write. I cannot write in a cafe or something. Okay. Co because I laugh when I say, oh yeah. And you know, when I say the sentence, or so do these kind of things that, that are totally embarrassing. Yeah, excellent. Okay, so I, I'm glad you did. Um, Edgar, I think this is the last of the questions because we've been talking for quite a while now. Actually, this interview will be is, is taped, so it's being recorded, so you can watch it um, whenever you like again. Thank you so much for having this conversation. It's a shame we couldn't meet in person in The Hague several weeks ago, but I, I enjoyed it very much, and I hope to see you next time in The Hague or somewhere else in person so we can check. Well, I, I'm going to come to Holland. You know, at the moment Excellent. I can fly. I'm, Excellent. You know, I'm going to come. Okay, and thanks everybody for, for watching and listening to us. And please buy the book, uh, this one or one of Edgar's uh, books. Watch the documentary uh, based on a true story. And I hope to see you all again. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.